Thank you very much, uh, Professor Boerta, for the invitation and to talk to you, to you. I feel quite uh, uh, humble <laughs> in, your, in your environment. Um, when I was in matric, I, well, I always considered to become a doctor and in matric I changed my, my mind and uh, went into the legal field, studied LLB at Stellenbosch and then uh, Eventually, I landed up in journalism. I hated the law. Uh, but now I'm Ombudsman of Media 24 for more than 90 of the newspapers countrywide. So I deal a lot with complaints from the media linking up to what you've just said. Um, we had a conference Monday and Tuesday on quackery and pseudoscience in Stellenbosch. You might have seen this lot. A lot of publicity on it and big debate going on at the moment on Twitter uh, because Professor Tim Noakes was criticized severely there because of his claim that he can, his diet can prevent cancer. He can guarantee that you won't get cancer. Um, that's the only slide we showed and then there was quite an uproar from, from he, uh, him, he and his whole cult. I call them cult and they don't like it but <laughs> because I've been personally been attacked and all, all the other people doing this. But I want to look at one of the very important... Can you switch off the slide, maybe? See the slide. Yeah, sure. That's too dark. Good I want to talk about the... the referring to your HPV uh, problem you had with the Argus. By the way, we had the same type of problem a report previewing the conference which was totally where they quoted me out of context I didn't even, they didn't even speak to me um, they took it from the press release and put it with with a traditional healer story which said this was medical apartheid this whole conference but uh, that is a type of, of uh, I can just tell you the standard of journalism uh, at the lower levels is really bad. Um, the, at the senior level, on political level, the investigative reporting that is taking place, the, 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 all these, Amo um, Gubani and all these investigations into Zuma and Gupta and all these things are excellent. They are excellent investigative reporters. They are excellent editors still around. But uh, we find it at the Department of Journalism, the junior, we're only a postgraduate department. We don't take uh, undergraduates. And so we get people with degrees into our first courses. So they should be able to write properly and do all those things. But um, so dealing, how do you as a medical scientist uh, uh, deal with wrong information that is published in the media, on the internet or wherever. And I'm going to talk about why social media has become so important, because if you've got a good Twitter account or a Facebook page or a vehicle according to which you can address a factual mistake immediately that is published in the media, it has far more telling uh, effect on rectifying the situation than writing, writing a letter for the Burger or Cape Argus or Cape Times, which takes two or three days before it's published, and many people who read the original letter might not have seen the, the new one. Uh, that's the type of problem we have. Okay, so um, on the question of baloney detector, um, Science and his counterparts, you as a scientist sit here and then you have all the truth people who think they have the truth, all the pseudoscience out there and people believing all sorts of things uh, that are not verified. And I think the whole, um, uh, we saw the past two days with the debate going on about pseudoscience and quackery, it is a serious, serious problem. Uh, Dr. Heinz Mödler also gave a presentation on placentophagia, the, the new, new craze among celebrities to eat their placentas. 
all the uh, he, he was very good in his lecture. He even had a placenta there too. As illustration, the effectivity of science communication. Don't make it boring, make it interesting. Of course, you're dealing with... But that is the type of thing we have. So you have the, these two worlds. Uh, why should scientists engage the public? Uh, should we stay in our ivory towers? Uh, in 1985, the Royal Society in Britain brought out a very comprehensive report. Uh, you might find it in our library or on the internet, in which they emphasize this point. You must learn to communicate with the public, be willing to do so, and indeed consider it their duty to do so. Uh, so you must learn about the media, because one of the best ways to communicate with the public, besides in your consulting rooms, is really through the media. And that's where social media has opened quite a big door of opportunity to scientists. And I will show you later. Uh, but that is another point. Explain it simply without jargon. You can't use jargon that the general public won't understand. You must come down to the masses. Get out of that, uh, that mountain of yours of jargon and climb it down and reach the people in the valley. Because they don't understand, they don't even understand what HPV means. They don't understand what HDL cholesterol and, and uh, uh, LDL cholesterol means. They don't know that. You have to immediately say bad and good cholesterol. You have to explain it immediately. There are many examples of this. Okay, so in a scientific community there's already a great understanding of good understanding that scientists must communicate. And it has improved tremendously, I must tell you that. Uh, Professor Tim Noakes is so successful because he communicates very well. Whether he's right or wrong is not the point. The point is he knows how to utilize the media. He never says no to a journalist to talk to them. Uh, maybe he should say, <laughs> sometimes refrain from doing it. But the point is, there are many. Uh, Professor Lee Berger from Witz, who was behind the, the leader of the team discovering the woman, a lady, in Sterkfontein. He's an American. The American scientists are usually good communicators. Uh, he's an excellent communicator. Uh, and there are quite a few other examples of that. Okay, uh, why scientists should communicate? The first thing is public accountability. You get your money quite often from the taxpayer. <laughs> big research programs that the government funds or semi-government institutions like the NRF or the South African Medical Research Council. So in some sense you have to repay the taxpayer for what you're doing. Influencing policy makers and pr practitioners. If you, if you look at good communicators uh, in the whole HIV debate, the, 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 the influence of, of scientists who supported the treatment action campaign of, of uh, 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 Mark Iwood and, and uh, uh, Nathan Geffen and that whole movement against the Mbeki government who didn't want to roll out antiretrovirals. Uh, and they eventually were successful in influencing the policy makers to roll out the antiretrovirals. Although it took about seven, eight years through court cases and things like that. Uh, then the question of stimulating additional funding. Uh, science is a, is, is a team, is teamwork usually. And the more you communicate, the better people see you and say, okay, that. I can tell you, Lee Berger and Philip Tobias and those people who were working at Sterkfontein, all those researchers through the years, they don't have a problem with funding. National Geographic uh, Society funds them, all sorts of organizations. Uh, so the more you're in the public eye, in some sense, in a positive way, the better chance you have getting additional funding. It helps. Uh, although that's not the alpha and omega. Encouraging collaborative work and research. Uh, other people get interested in what you're doing. They see you, and they, f they want to get onto the bandwagon. They want to be part of your team. So you get... Uh, 
If you look at uh, the, the SKA, is a very good example of that, the, the square kilometer array. That South Africa got the bit, and uh, it is an international collaborative effort of nine countries, with the European Union involved and everything. South Africa can't fund it alone. And our scientists can't. I've heard the recently that there are a long list of, of astronomers, radio astronomers, waiting to become part of SKI. They don't have place for everybody, even in these regional stages. Then also the greater control over research and how its findings are presented in the media. If you communicate well with the media, with a journalist, uh, you can... Let me put it like this. There's, there's a basic rule in journalism that you never show your story to your source beforehand because you, you're afraid of interference, censorship, that people will twist the story to, to fit their own agenda. But in science journalism, it is a standing agreement. I've, I've, as a science journalist, I've many times, after I've written a story and I quoted somebody, I phoned the person and said, I quoted you in this context, I send them that, those parts and say, do I understand you correctly? Because I'm not a physicist, and I have to understand intricate physicists, uh, uh, physics or biology or whatever, so I have to do lots of research, I have to do interviews, but sometimes the scientists will lose me. So I have to make sure that, that the findings are presented. When many scientists are very scared of the media and... They don't want to communicate because they've been burned. The journalist got it wrong, and you are laughing at your colleagues in the way you've been represented in the media, or presented in the media. And I can understand that. That's why a good relationship between scientists and, and, communicate, uh, and journalists, the media as such, is, a very, is, is the ideal situation. Uh, then, should scientists expect scientific literacy from the public? If I can ask that you. I know we all want people to be scientifically literate. So Africa is a developing country, and we, we need good scientists and, and technologists and engineers. But should we expect the public to be scientifically literate? Uh, Robert Parker was a scientific advisor of President Bill Clinton's presidency, he wrote an excellent book. Um, you can get all of it. It's a very, very nice book to read. He shows the, 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 the mistakes science makes. But he, he emphasizes it, that you don't have to have so much knowledge of science, but the scientific worldview. I tell that to my students all the time. When, they, when I start teaching in February the, the first module, the module in science journalism, I tell them, I understand that you're not going to be scientifically literate at the end of this year. That's not the aim. But at least to get you to understand the scientific worldview. Uh, that, there's, that we live in an orderly universe governed by physical laws that cannot be circumvented. You can't circumvent gravity. Even if the postmodernist said any, any story can count. It doesn't work that way. If you step off this building, you will fall. You will go down. So the natural law of gravity is still there. The scientific worldview must be there. Merchants of doubt, quackery and pseudoscience on the rise. If we look at uh, what has happened because of bad communication, that, that uh, the media gave too much attention to, to problems in, in pseudoscience and they didn't, immediately expose these people, eventually. We had our own denialists uh, uh, eventually leading to Luc Montagne and François Barre Senussi winning the, the Nobel Prize for that link that they made. Anti-vaccination campaign at the moment, it's a serious problem. And one of the latest rumors are, and he doesn't want to deny or confirm it, is that Professor Narx is an anti-vaccine, he's, he's getting onto that bandwagon. Which, if it's true, it will be tragic. Uh, but that, that story, if you look at all the celebrities created by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who was kicked out of the medical fraternity by the British uh, uh, Medical Council, J. 
Jenny McCarthy, who was a, a Playboy pin-up girl in the in the eight nineties, the son has autism. Robert De Niro, the great actor, who suddenly has gone on this back bandwagon. Robert Kennedy Jr., Oprah Winfrey calling McCarthy a mother warrior on the show. So they, there's a powerful lobby of celebrities driving this thing without any scientific evidence. In, in, instead, the scientific evidence is overwhelming that they're totally wrong. It's been proven over and over again. Climate change denialists starting in the White House. Uh, the fossil fuel industry, um, uh, they, they, there are many examples of that. Uh, the anti-evolutionist creationism and intelligent, we're 150 years down the line from Darwin's publication of the origin of species, and we still have people who believe that the Earth is 6,000 years old. So what went wrong? Why does the media, why do they give a platform to denialists? Uh, then the diet fads thing, um, uh, Simon Singh, he spoke on Skype at our conference uh, from from United Kingdom. He was sued by the United Kingdom Chiro Chiropractic Association because he said they were endangering little children's and babies' lives by doing neck manipulations. And he called them scam artists. And then they sued him. Eventually, about 30,000 scientists signed a petition against this whole case, and they dropped the case. But it changed the British defamation laws. Because of, of the huge media in t attention, Simon Singh, by the way, is a physicist uh, who wrote one award-winning books, um, uh, popular science books, won the Aventus Prize for, for Fermat's last theorem. Uh, these miracles, you know all these things. Banting is the latest craze. Um, Okay, let me go to the media, how we function in the media. There are two dramatic changes to the news ecosystem. Traditional news publishers have lost control over the distribution of news. Uh, the news is now filtered through algorithms and platforms which are opaque and unpredictable. Why is this so? Because in the old days, in the old days is still the case in, in many instances, a newspaper like Cape Times and Burger, morning papers, they will have to be distributed to wherever they're being sold. If the Burger's country edition goes out, it goes as far as Namakoland. And it has to be carried there, transported there with trucks. So it's a whole process. Uh, so now we're starting to work with the Google, the Facebook, all those algorithms, clicks. They talk about clicks. How many times did somebody click on the web page on a specific story, and that's how they measure whether a story is, whether the public likes that type of story. The second one is the inevitable outcome of this is the increase in power of social media companies, and, and the, the largest of them, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, uh, and then second order companies like Twitter and Snapchat. Uh, I don't know all of, most of you I suppose use WhatsApp. First place, you don't pay for it if you've got internet uh, in the sense that you, you bypass MTN and Vodacom and those people. Uh, but there's a different platform suddenly of distributing news. Many people getting their news today get it through Facebook. They've got a Facebook page and Facebook feeds them with news. The same with Amazon, the same with Google. Uh, that means, for example, that uh, uh, and it had a very serious influence. The first effect of that was the American presidential election because of fake bots that were sent out uh, saying all sorts of scurrilous things about Hillary Clinton, uh, which now comes out was orchestrated by the Russian government, and it will come out. The wheel turns slowly, but I just sat on my phone and looked at the New York Times of today and the new evidence that is coming out about how Putin is doing it. Um, so the power of social media is suddenly, it's suddenly very, very good, very strong.
and dangerous. Um, and Bell wrote that in the Columbia Journalism Review, one of the most respected uh, journalism uh, magazines or journals. Uh, Facebook is eating the world. It's not only Facebook, but Twitter and all these others. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was a Canadian communication scientist. In 1957, he formulated the concept of the global village. He was a prophet in that sense. That was 43 plus 17, that's 60 years ago. He formulated this. And now it's absolutely true. Uh, the media as an extension of our senses, and now Twitter is extending our senses to tens of millions of people who are often right on the scene where things are happening. The effect that you, the power you have as, for example, a Twitter account holder or a Facebook account holder, and you've got a cell phone and you see something happening, an accident, and you take your camera off the phone and you... You remember the case of the police dragging uh, foreign immigrants behind the police vehicle that was put on YouTube, that surfaced on so social media, and there are many examples of this. The, 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 the killing of, I um, can't remember his name now, but in Fuchsburg during uh, four or five years ago, it was, became known through social media. Uh, so th the effect of these things are very, very powerful. Twitter's constantly updating record of up to minute reaction has in some instances tend to use serve media coverage of breaking news. Uh, I, I have a Twitter account and I, we, during this conference on Monday and Tuesday, we used a hashtag quackbusters. So every time somebody tweeted, they used quackbusters. So you can immediately pick up in all the tweets that were sent out by their delegates there, and all the people reacting and distributing it further. It's like a spider's web going out across the world. Uh, and you can very easily trace it. It's very powerful. So if somebody publishes something incorrectly in the Argus, and you as a scientist can immediately say, you know how to use Twitter or Facebook, and you immediately say, but this is wrong. You get the right links for example, to scientific articles published on this, peer-reviewed articles. Um, why Social Media 101 for Scientists? Uh, and what, Bell, what uh, the, Bell wrote in the Columbia Journalism Review, I've uh, put it in bold, the social media hasn't just swallowed journalism, it has swallowed everything. Look at the students walking out here. They, they, there's such a lot of research now about why, why motor accidents take place with people using their cell phones, tweeting, why people are crossing inadvertently across a motor uh, 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 traffic intersection because they are busy with their cell phones. So lots of these things happen, but it shows you how people are involved with a, a world outside their world, the immediate surroundings. Uh, it has swallowed political campaigns. Think on the Trump campaign. Think what is going to happen, uh, what is already happening apparently within the ANC structures, the, the lobbying between uh, Nkosazana, uh, Tlamini Zuma's supporters, and Cyril Ramaphosa's support supporters. They're using social media all over Christ, spreading rumors, saying bad things about other people telling lies. It happens all the time. I'll show you examples. Banking systems, personal histories, the leisure industry, retail, even government security. And the funny pocket uh, portal to the world. Uh, and this heralds enormously exciting opportunities for education. It's not a bad thing just. It is a very good thing also. Uh, journalism is a small subsidiary activity of the main business of social platforms. So, how are you going to utilize it in your medical field to your advantage to spread a... For example, on the HPV uh, vaccination. Uh, you, it's still a debate out there by some people who regard it as a debate.
because of all sorts of social and religious reasons. Um, why social media 101 for scientists? Studies have shown that it is indeed beneficial for scientists and scientific institutes to have an online social media pre presence. A recent study that sh uh, studied Twitter, and that Twitter can foster better public engagement of science. And I will show you why I'm saying this. Um, uh, now, I'll first look at the ups and downs of social media. Scientists are increasingly using Twitter as a tool for communicating science. Just who of you have a Twitter account? Few. Uh, there's no, nothing wrong about it. I don't know if you've read John Ronson's book. He's a British uh, documentary filmmaker for the BBC, but he's also an award-winning journalist for The Guardian. And he wrote a book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which he takes case studies that happened in America and the United Kingdom about what people said on Twitter and in the social media, on the social media and how they, it destroyed their lives. There's a, one good example relating to South Africa, an American public relations uh, uh, officer, woman in, in a big public relations company in America working on, on uh, she came for a holiday to Cape Town and she sent out a tweet at JF Kennedy Airport. No, at, La at Heathrow, she flew from JFK to Heathrow and then to South Africa. When she was at Heathrow, she said, I'm on my way to South Africa. She's a white woman, said, I hope I won't get HIV. So there goes my tweet. And when she landed at Cape Town International, this tweet has been all over the, 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 the social media sphere. Everybody knew about it. Photographers were waiting for her at Cape Town Airport because of the power of social media. So beware of what you're saying. It can destroy. There are, South, there are court cases in South Africa now where people have been saying certain things on social media platforms, uh, libelous, def defamatory things, and have been sued and... The courts gave them compensation. Uh, so Twitter can promote scholarly discussion, disseminate research rapidly. In one way it does it, for example, is by scientists tweeting and then putting the original link there, which is a nightmare for these closed sourced scientific publications, Elsevier and all those people. Because now suddenly people have access to it. You don't have to pay $10 or $50 for the article. The scientist has put it on Twitter. So you can read it there. So there are ways to bypass the, the capitalists, if you want to put it like that. Uh, however, scientists also caution that if Twitter does not accurately convey science due to the inherent brevity of this medium, misinformation could escape quickly. And that is a big problem. You not only spread the right messages, the rumor mongering also goes. It goes all over the place. Uh, the challenges of accurately reporting science on Twitter in 140 characters, it's now 280, I think. They've moved it up now. Uh, Leon Lederman won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics, and he said if the basic idea is too intricate to fit on a T-shirt, it's probably wrong. Uh, that's not really true, but it's what I said at the beginning. What's the challenge? Can you explain yourself very briefly, simply, correctly, accurately? Uh, Lederman was also the, the, the scientist who made the mistake. He afterwards regretted it of calling uh, the Higgs boson the God particle. He said, and then the media went to town with it because they thought immediately now we found God somewhere or some, the original particle that God created, which was total, non total nonsense. Uh, that's not what the Higgs boson was all about. But he, he tried to bring it down to the masses and it went out of control. 
Okay, uh, the darker side, the dangerous infection spread by social media. Social media spread information with the accurate of fact even faster than a virus can spread an infection. I quickly want to look at the Ebola virus. Uh, when, when it first broke, uh, there was a darker side of social media, the voracious spread of misinformation. Uh, so all ro sorts of rumors went about in West Africa that you can eat raw onion. It sounds like uh, Dr. Mantu Chabalala Misimang with HIV. Eating koala nut or drinking coffee have all surfaced as solutions. And in Nigeria, people died of drinking that. So you see, the Center for Disease Control, the WHO, had to come in and counter all this misinformation. But the problem is if one person starts tweeting and, and that person has a lot of followers, you will immediately get this message multiply. That is what... what, what um, McLuhan said in 1957, the global village creates eventually that things spread so fast with the internet. Now, then he didn't know it, but he was prophetic in that sense. Uh, based on Facebook and Twitter chatter, it can seem like Ebola is everywhere following the first diagnosis of Ebola in the United States on September 30th. There were mentions of the virus on Twitter and it leapt from 100 per minute to more than 6,000 within minutes virtually. Uh, and then you have to spend the stem the start of, of spreading bad informa information. Uh, but the comparison they've been made, like the Ebola virus, which is a very dangerous virus, was like a real, uh, was spread, and then you had this real world virus on the internet. Not the Ebola itself, but the rumors that, the misinformation about it. Um, so infected internet users who may have picked up bogus info from an inaccurate media report, your example of the Argus, uh, people read and say, oh my, without knowing really what is happening because the journalist got it wrong or the Twitter user got it wrong. Uh, so they were infecting each other. And you know the power of, of spreading wrong. So between 16 September and 6 October, 10.5 million tweets mentioning the word Ebola were recorded. Uh, and you can see the spikes that took place every time there was a wrong rumor and then it went up. And then it died down a little bit and then suddenly it go, went up again. Uh, the darker side, the anti-vaccination campaign, I don't want to go into detail of that but you know it, uh, but the final episode in the saga, uh, they were found guilty of deliberate fraud. They picked and chose data that suited their case. They falsified facts, and the British Medical Journal has published a series of articles exposure of this fraud. Uh, and you will know this virus has spread. We had an outbreak in Stellenbosch recently. And the first thing that people said, yes, but it must have been in the people who were a little bit more ignorant in that areas of Stellenbosch uh, and because the parents didn't know that their children had to be inoculated. No, it took place in Paul Rose from Nashen. Highly educated parents said, we're not going to inoculate our, goodness, our children. You, you see how strong this virus has spread. Outbreak of measles in Wales, in California, and various other countries. Australia brought in a new law that said if you, your child is not inoculated, vaccinated, you can't put that child in a public school. They've made the law now, and I think the laws will come all over the world now. Uh, but the celebrities driving this, Robert De Niro and, and uh, these people. The influence of celebrities on spreading quackery. Jenny McCarthy, uh, Robert Kennedy, Gwyneth Paltrow. I don't know who of you have seen Gwyneth Paltrow's website, Goop. It's very much in your field <laughs> in some sense because she deals with vaginas and, and new methods to... I don't want to go into it. I'm not an expert. But the point is many people follow her and buy those products at huge costs. Uh, so Michael Caine, Prince Charles, that, there's a big quack. <laughs> Future king of England, of the, of the United Kingdom. Larry King, and, Larry King on his show, he hosted Deepak Chopra, 
during the tsunami of 2004, and I saw it with my own eyes. I went on the internet and found it again. He sat there, he had him as a guest on the show shortly after the 2004 tsunami. And he asked, he, uh, the, uh, Chopra said, if all of us were concentrating, looking at that wave, we would have stopped it through our mental powers. Uh, now, that is the type of nonsense the media can spread. Larry, Larry King was a highly respected talk show host. That's the power of the media to spread misinformation. The media has a dirty mirror. There has, that's the reason a view of the media as a dirty mirror held up by science and opaque lens and able adequately to reflect and filter scientific facts. This is a research study by Bucci. He's an Italian uh, communica science communicator. Uh, and that is very true. In my world, let me just explain to you Briefly, until when I'm very nearly finished. Yeah, I, in my world, in South Africa, let's take South Africa. Only one newspaper in South Africa of the 17 daily newspapers has a designated science desk with a designated science editor. But they all have political editors, arts editors, economic editors, sports editors. Why is science neglected like that? It's not, South Africa is not unique. It's all over the world, the same case. CNN, for example, when the big crunch came uh, in 2008 with the financial woes, CNN closed down its whole very strong unit of science reporters, which was a tragedy. They were doing a good job. Uh, so you get a, a, a media reporting on science and holding up a dirty mirror of how science looks. And it is, again, it is a serious problem. And so the dilemma of the receiver of science, Dorothy Nelkin was a, she died recently, but she was a great researcher on science, the effect of science and the media in society. The dilemma of the receiver of science, although we depend on the media for science news, there's little understanding of the relationships between scientists and journalists that lie behind the images of science. I did a research study that was published in 2011 in a peer-reviewed journal. It was the first study looking at the relationship between South African scientists and South African journalists. And I had uh, about 1,200 scientists to answer the question and about seminar journalists on all sorts of questions. And it was interesting to see the misunderstanding and the lack of the lack of knowledge that journalists have of science. But the the fear that scientists have of the media. The same thing. Uh, but if social media have swallowed journalism, how dirty has the mirror reflecting science new news now indeed become. Uh, there are a few steps to clean the dirty media reflecting science. Create and maintain a Twitter account or Facebook or social media post. It is worthwhile doing it. Try and go and create for yourself a Twitter account. I will give you examples of that. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example, the physicist broadcasting uh, the, the anchor behind the new Cosmos series, the follow-up of, of uh, a series from the 70s uh, of which Carl Sagan was the... Uh, he has more than 7 million followers on Twitter. You can imagine. This is a scientist, so people are interested in what a scientist is saying. So you, they have a lot of power. Uh, so create and maintain a Twitter account is cost effective. Uh, for example, if you have, if you can summarize in 140 or 280 characters what your research says or the, what the latest research says on a specific topic, and then you put the link there, because then people can click on the link and then they can read the original article. Not that they will understand much of it. Quite often they won't understand a thing, because of scientific jargon in a peer-reviewed journal. 
but create connections with the prominent news media in order to give proper exposure to science. When tweeting science, make sure to tag relevant local news media. By tagging, they mean, you all understand, you use a, a uh, um, I can't use it, you use that hashtag with a, a, a search, possible search engine that can very easily be picked up. We use the hashtag quackbusters, because the conference was about quackery. So, because everybody used it, it immediately you've got a whole library of tweets on quackbusters, on quackery. Um, so learn to, to, to get comfortable with social media. If a tweet by a science organization gets retweeted by a major trusted news outlet, it will instantly expand the audience. If, for example, Reuters or Associated Press or Deutsche Presse Agentur uh, or Agence France Press pick it up, it will spread. Or the BBC broadcast it. BBC has a very good, strong science section. If you go onto their website, you will see. Uh, then follow and monitor your field of science. And do not keep quiet when quacks spread unscientific and pseudoscientific nonsense. Let me tell you, it's the most effective way to counter them. If you see something published in the media, whether it's on the internet or wherever, if you have an account, you can immediately counter it. Because then you tag in that original publication and you give the real facts. Uh, so, if we keep quiet as scientists, the rumor or the nonsense will continue and it will continue, and it will never be killed. Build embargo. I don't wait for an embargo to be lifted before first tweeting about announcement. I know you have to wait. If you study, a, 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 if you publish a study, you can't go and make it available before it is published. I, every day I get, as I'm registered at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Eureka Alert's website. I don't know who of you know Eureka Alert. Go, go on it. It is like Eureka, but uh, alert, you know, Eureka, uh, and that car becomes an, an alert at the end, L-E-R-T, like being alert. They've got a fantastic website and a database, uh, and I get two emails per day in which they sent out the, the latest research in all peer-reviewed studies that they have access to. And what they do is they put embargoes on it. So you may not, we may not as journalists break that story before it's published in Science or in Nature or the New England Medical Journal or the Lancet or whatever. But that doesn't say that you can't create expectations. You can say, you can uh, tickle the interest of people by saying, watch out, on Friday we are publishing amazing results on HIPV, HPV, whatever. You, you see what I mean? That you are preempting it without giving the story away. Use hashtags that will most likely be linked to a story. Include them in tweets. For example, Vaxxed, that is the f infamous movie that Robert De Niro is involved with. Or anti-vaccination, or vaccinations work, or all these, uh, you will find many examples of that. If you do a search on Twitter, you will immediately find them. Uh, open more than one Twitter account in order to separate research uh, projects or topics. Uh, and news media and science, uh, Runel Bester in, in this medical faculty, they've got a Twitter account. Uh, and during our conference, the, the medical faculty's Twitter account was used numerous times. So people can pick it up by just searching for that, and they will pick up all the tweets regarding that. Uh, consider learning to use tag six or similar software to quickly and easily study how tweets are spread and retweet. I don't expect you to do that. but. If you start doing research on this, you will quickly find very interesting stuff. Uh, continuously foster trust among social media public by providing regular updates on work being done. Uh, so don't keep quiet when things are wrong. You can use 
social media to, to um, sorry. Any questions? I can elaborate forever, but uh, the, the importance is for me just to show you, don't be afraid of social media. Uh, you, utilize it to advantage of your own science, your own training, and to inform people out there, because you're dealing with the public every day. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much. We use the microphone just for the recording. Um, just maybe a quick comment for myself. I, I find it sometimes very distressing to try and react to somebody who has no intention to even try and be scientific. Mm. And sometimes I think that's a lost cause. On the other hand, if it's, if it's one of us and it's a peer and it's somebody who should actually be mm. a scientist, I think then you must come down with a vengeance. Uh, I don't know what you want to say uh, about sort of responding yes. to a quack. In, yeah. Yes, it's, it's a very good question because uh, uh, my, my argument is you can't keep quiet because science only grows and the findings of science only go out there and are understood correctly if, if knowledgeable scientists can inform the public that they, what the real facts are. Uh, let's take the anti-vaccination campaign. It's also in the field of HPV. There's a strong lobby saying, because of religious and all sorts of other quackery reasons, uh, that uh, young girls shouldn't be vaccinated in that field. It's, 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 and it's just, they, they're very strong because they're activists. And if, if scientists keep quiet, and that's what the Royal Society already said in 1985, science shouldn't keep quiet. They should immediately counter. I know, the, the irritation factor is big. The irritation factor around Tim Noakes, and the, 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 he's been asked two questions, for example, time and again by scientists on Twitter. Tell us, you've said that you, your, your diet, banting will... The LCHF diet will prevent cancer. You guarantee that. How can you say that? No scientist can guarantee anything. And the second one they ask him now is, you've been interviewed by Dr. Mercola, and Mercola is a known, his famous website, he's a known anti-vaccination campaigner. You've been interviewed by, by him, put out there as a hero, but who is interviewing you? So are you anti-vaccination? He doesn't want to answer the question. He's the uh, Sally Ann Creed, who was the nutritionist, the so-called dietitian who wrote the book uh, a Real Meal Revolution, with him. She openly retweeted anti-vaccination campaign tweets. So she's clearly anti-vaccination. Let me tell you my own personal experience with her. I emailed her one day and asked her, what, the, what are your qualifications? Because you say in the book that you've got a postgraduate degree from uh, some Australian Bush University. She doesn't call it that, but I've, when I went into it, I, it's like these American internet universities that give you a good doctorate in, in theology in six months, a PhD. The guy who treated Joost van Westhuis, Anton Nedler, he's not a doctor, he's a doctor in theology with a six months doctorate in... But I ask her, please tell me, what, is, what does your CV say? If you say you've got a postgraduate degree, what was your undergraduate degree? Where did you get it? She didn't want to answer me. She said, no, I'm a private person. I said, no, you're not a private person. You are the author of a book that is a bestseller in South Africa, and people trust you. So please tell us, honestly, I, I still don't know. You see, that is that you must counter that. You can't keep quiet. I ask that specifically because I have wrote a book about quackery, and the English translation will be... Uh, in the on the market in February, March. Okay. Any comments, questions from the audience?
Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, just a comment, I think one of the challenges is that when we write and talk scientifically, we um, try to leave out emotive words and uh -huh. sort of um, words like always and never and guarantee, whereas those are the words that appeal to the public. And so I find that the readers that are actually looking for the truth eventually find that the majority are just swayed by the emotive language. Yeah. So that in immediately puts us on the back foot. Um, yeah. And then I wanted to just, as a quick example, share how my recent experience with social media, which was positive but completely overwhelming, um, I was asked to do a 10 minute radio talk um, by the independent department for a small Christian radio station that I really didn't think anybody listened to. Um, and I didn't want to do the talk and I was told that it's like not voting if you're not willing to talk about what you believe in um, and spread the information so along what you were saying. And the next day, after the, it was a 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the talk was, and the next morning at 8 o'clock, I was doing student exams and I introduced myself to the UCT external examinator. And the first thing she said was, I know who you are. And I've never met her. And she said that the talk had been shared on their consultant forum mm -hmm. and that she'd already seen and listened to it. Yeah. So, um, and I mean, I'm not an expert, I'm not a specialist. I'm a medical officer that spoke on Christian radio. Yeah. And, so, and that's just one example of how powerful information can be. It's a very good example. Um, I appreciate you, you, you sharing that with us. That is, don't ever, un, you said a small Christian, the, 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 the religious stations are never small. <laughs> uh, because they, the community radio has to get licenses. And they are, South Africa is a very religious country, although if you look at people not stopping at stop streets and... <laughs> uh, I, I think we're the most, uh, we don't adhere to any laws. We, we think uh, the other guy is doing it, so we do it ourselves. So always go on those stations, or any station. I, there's a station, Smile uh, Radio in South, in, here in Cape Town, uh, and they contacted me f before this conference. And I was, I was uh, you know, Smile is small and whatever. The journalist had an interview of 18 minutes with me. And they broadcasted, I first spoke English and then Afrikaans because they rebroadcasted in both languages various times during the day. And that is the way journalists should function. She asked informed questions, she did her homework, whereas I had an experience with a um, Cape Argus reporter who phoned me, didn't know anything about the conference. I said, go and read it up on the website. Everything's there, and then you phone me, and then I can enlighten you, because now I'm talking into a vacuum. And she didn't phone me again, and then they published this terrible story, uh, which was totally nonsense, absolute nonsense. There's, science is universal. It's not about culture and all those things. Evidence works or it doesn't work. I think a few simpler rules. I, I don't have a Facebook account anymore. I deleted my account. About I've closed my account too because of various reasons. But, yeah, but don't, is... don't, don't tweet or Facebook when you're um, under the influence of whatever. <laughs> or very excited. And don't do it when you're angry. Um, yeah. um, I mean, somebody like Trevor Noah um, got sort of uh, flagged for something he said, you know, 10 years ago. So, yes. what is the memory of tweets? Uh, I think Twitter is since 2009. I think but, it's about... But you can search all, oh, all yes. the way back. It is there unless you delete it. But even then, computer scientists can, uh, they can go into deleted... Uh, if, if, you, if the, the FBI and, and, and those people, that's how they, they uh, find out about terrorists uh, quite often. People... Uh, because they go into old cell phone records and things like that. Any final comments or questions before we go? Well, it reminds me to thank you very much for an uh, interesting talk. We, <clears throat> um, we need to work a little bit on our own public 
um, appearance from this department. I, I think we can do better in terms of the way we communicate um, our own scientific work. Um, we can maybe see that as a challenge for the new year. Um, uh, Professor Klaassen, I hope we'll see you again. And we'll certainly um, invite Absolutely. you again to speak um, on this topic. I think it's uh, been an interesting afternoon. And I wish you all a pleasant uh, December. Remember about tomorrow evening's end of year function. And then we'll see you again probably tomorrow toward... Uh, you, you still have to come to work, those of you who are working. But for the academic program, we say goodbye for the year. We'll see you again probably towards the end of February next year. Professor Buda, I can just say, add to this. If you have any questions on dealing with the media, email me anytime. On, I'm on the university uh, email. I'll, I'll give advice gladly. I, hopefully it will help. But don't be afraid. It's tackle the media and trust them and do it. But, but as Professor Buda said, don't be angry. <laughs>